I first met Damien McGrain in 1986. The glitz and glamour of tour life were far from his mind when he set out on his journey, which has taken him from club professional at Wexford Golf Club to evolve a China Open champion on the European tour. Damien, welcome to the cut line. Uh, it's great to sit down with you here at Knightsbrook Golf and Country Club, an attachment um, that you've had for the last few years. 2011 was a tough year for you, Damien, which has been, you know, not the norm in recent years. Is there anything you can put your finger on there? You're sure right there. I, you know, I struggled with my game. I struggled with my scoring. My short game wasn't as good as it needed to be, or has has been in the past. And um, the number on my scorecards from for 12 months in a row, Gary, were, were poor. Um, I was disappointed with just the way it was happening for me. I was working hard. I, I'm a creature of habit, so nothing ever changes with me. And uh, after so many steady years and consistent results, mm -hmm. all of a sudden I found myself in where I've never been before, struggling to keep my card and um, and struggling with my game. Yeah. Because if your game is solid, your card's not an issue. But if your game is, you know, if you're not writing the right number on the scorecard every week, um, you're struggling to make ends meet. So I had a funny le year last year and um, thanks be to God, it's 2012 and I put it behind me and move on. It was funny though, because I was looking at your stats and, and the margins are so fine. You know, your stroke average, this kind of was a half a shot in the difference type of thing between that and, and big years. Yeah, I, I don't dwell on the Why stats not? myself, never have, but I felt I felt that my putting, my short game was substandard. My putting, I felt, was, was very poor compared to, you know, I used to be very tidy around the hole. The closer mm -hmm. I got, I'd never miss short putts. And last year, I found myself missing some. And uh, all of a sudden, it, 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 you know, I wasn't making the birdies to back yeah. it up and get myself out of trouble. Um, so, you know, I'm glad it's over. It was a tough 12 months and uh, I survived it all and I kept my car just about. So, you know, let's get on with it. Yeah. One question I've always been meaning to ask you is the majors and not qualifying for the majors. Is there any, do you have any theory on that or why, why is that so? I, I'm not into playing 36 holes in a day. You know, I think about 12 holes that suit me each day, but yeah. uh, you know, 36 in one day is not my form, and on a Monday as well. So um, I just, I played two British Opens and I enjoyed them and had a great time and it was a very positive experience. But uh, as regards Monday qualifying for, for uh, major championships, I've no interest. Never had and I never will. And is that the creature I have with the fact that you set yourself a schedule for the year and, and you, you just stick to it regardless of form or regardless of, of what position you're in? I've tended to, to, to get myself into a routine and I stick to my routine. So, so if I'm playing the previous week to this Monday qualifying of 36 holes, it actually doesn't suit me. Because that, that, that in itself is like playing a tournament, trying right. to qualify for the majors. So squeezing, trying to squeeze three tournaments into two weeks or 14 days doesn't suit me. And um, I just feel that if I do that, I'd be sacrificing the week before and the week after on the possibility of qualifying for a major championship. And uh, as I say, I, I got in a different direction into two majors already and uh, I enjoyed playing them, but you know, it's not for me, 36 in a day, no way. And is that something that the Tour should look at to maybe go back to the old system where you know, the last event got you in a major rather than, because they're kind of flogging the guys really, aren't they, with well, a I lot think, of golf? Yeah, the, I think the Tour have so much going on yeah. and they're expecting the players to play so often now. I think we're all asked to play a lot more golf than we used to. Um, we, As players, we feel we have to play more because mm -hmm. it, it, the standard is so high now. And, you know, if you look at the order of merit or you look at the race of Dubai now, guys have won hundreds of thousands of euros. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we all need to get playing, pack our bags, get out there on tour and start making money fast because everybody else seems to be doing it. Yeah. So we, we play a lot now compared to even five years ago, I think we played a lot less. Yeah. Is it a case where you now prioritise certain events you play in or do you just like to play when you play as such? I like to form a routine myself and um, I like to play, play some golf in a block and then I like to have a little bit of time off. Uh, I always come home for my time off. I don't go to Dubai or I don't go to Spain like some players do. Um, I live I live in Kells County Mead, so um, I come home, take it easy, and then 
organise another block of golf, and that that helps me to play into some form. Right. And then when I have some form, then needless to say, look for a couple of results. So that's the way I've always done it, and that that works okay for me. Do you find that you're good at switching on and off from tour? When you're on tour, you, that's your business, and when you come home, what's your what's your uh, procedure like when you're home? I've I've always stepped kept a schedule and uh, I'm happy with the schedule I have. When I'm at home I do very little and then when I'm a away I play golf every day and uh, I focus myself purely on the golf. Um, so yeah I need time to get away from it. Yeah. So uh, I'm more than happy to come home and uh, leave the clubs alone. Um, some guys go home to better climates than I go home to yeah. and that's their choice but uh, you know downtime is good and you know, I, I can take it or leave it with the yeah. golf, but uh, when I'm away, I give it 100%. I, I was always amazed at how much you rest when you're away on, on tour. Like, you, you know, you do your business and then it's downtime off the course. You know, you relax a lot, you know, which is a form of practice in itself, really. Is that something that you're conscious of doing? Maybe not conscious of it now. Right. Maybe I'm, I'm getting lazier by the day <laughs> and that's possibly coming with, with time as well. But. Uh, unfortunately, what's happened to me is that when I started playing golf, I couldn't wait to play, and I loved it. Whereas now, I play because I have to play. Right. Uh, I play because I have to support myself and my family. I play because I have to keep my tour card, and and I'm privileged to be out on tours, no doubt about it. But uh, the buzz has gone a bit, and uh, now all of a sudden, I feel like it's more like work, and I'm getting older. Yeah. So getting out of bed at five in the morning is, is a lot more difficult than it used to be. Yeah. There was a time I used to love getting up to go, go away and play golf, whereas now it's a bit more tedious. Do you find it's, it's very, you know, the fact that the tour has you know, branched out to faraway places, that it's a lot harder on the body? You mentioned the 5 a.m. wake-up call, which would probably you know, get in Malaysia or places like that, and, and rain delays. And, you know, it's, it is getting harder and harder, really, to compete. Well, we certainly have to travel more, but I think, you know, I, I think the travelling is getting easier. So the travelling is no bother. I do struggle with jet lag when I come home, which, which is a nasty side of our business. Yeah. Um, I'm sick of it, to be honest. I've been jet lagged every time I come back from the Far East. Uh, so, but I, I actually like the, the culture out there. I've, as I say, or as we know, I won the China Open out there in 2008. So I, I, like, I like going out to that side of the world. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the travel is difficult. I'm getting a bit older, and the jet lag is certainly more difficult to get over every time. Damien, what was the experience in the majors like compared to playing in a regular tournament? Once I qualified and got into the majors, it was very exciting because they are certainly different. They're, um, they're a lot more emphasis on the players. Is that because there's no pro-am type of thing? Or? I just think that I just think that everybody's so excited. Yeah. Um, they're so well organised, so well run. The players are looked after, fantastic. And um, you know, <laughs> I spent my week trying to get tickets for my friends and family, and it's certainly a bit unusual those events. But um, they're well run. Um, the golf courses are more difficult than normal. I found. Yeah. Um, and the international fields were certainly exciting to play because you don't know who you're playing with. You, yeah. you might know who you're playing with and you play with some good characters from the USA or from Asia or whatever. So, um, you know, they're definitely very much different. But I'm so used to playing regular tour events that playing two majors all of a sudden was um, a treat and a bonus. Do you find that the top players put a little bit more pressure on themselves in the majors compared to you know, say someone like yourself, a stalwart on the European tour, but, you know, winning majors is probably not a, a major focus for you as such. Yeah, for me it was, it was another week and another tournament. Um, I qualified to get into the tournament, so I just put it into my schedule. Uh, needless to say, the top players in the world focus on the majors and um, the base of schedule and the, the, whole, the whole being around four majors so do you agree with that or disagree um, with it? I find it a bit unusual an unusual mentality but I'm not I'm not in the situation that that I'm I'm basing a schedule on a major so I suppose if I was in that situation I'd have to treat things differently right. but um, you know I think stacking your year to perform in four particular weeks is putting a lot of pressure on yourself yeah and you know and I know that uh, you never know when you're going to hit form yeah. And when you hit form, you, you, you ride the crest of the wave, 
you milk it for all it's worth and you yeah. enjoy it for as long as it lasts because it doesn't last forever. No. Damien, we mentioned the Irish Open there. What Would that be one of your main goals of your career, to try win an Irish Open? Yeah. I think anybody who's the head screwed on properly would love to win an Irish Open. Uh, and I think all the Irish players, that that's their goal, I think. You know, Shane done incredible, didn't yeah. he? And uh, to win it in Baltre was obviously special also. I think an Irish Open on a Lynx course is, is, is something special as well. So... Um, I'm looking forward to Port Rush again this year and um, funny enough I enjoy the Irish Open and, and uh, I think it possibly if I may say it, it brings the best out in my game mm -hmm. and uh, I'm looking forward to the challenge again this year. Yeah because obviously competing at home you, you have a good record at home over the years so a love affair with Port Rush did you play much up there? I, I, I've actually I only went up there last weekend right. so I, I played uh, two games up there last weekend in between the hail showers and uh, you know, it's a beautiful, beautiful place, so um, I'm looking forward to getting up there to play the Irish Open. I, I think it's great it's gone across the border, so to speak, the fact that the, the boys from Ulster have had such a you know, huge effect on the game of golf for the last couple of years. It's richly deserved, I think. Absolutely, yeah. You know, we're very lucky that uh, golf in Ireland is so strong at the moment. Um, uh, needless to say, the three lads up the north have done incredibly well, four of them actually, including yeah. Michael, so um, they've done incredibly well. So. Um, Irish Open up the north, why not? Yeah. Sounds great to me anyway. Yeah. So um, I have my house booked and my family are ready to go. Next on the cut line, the importance of success at the Ryder Cup for the European Tour. If Europe had lost the Ryder Cup over the last few years, I'd shiver to think what position we would be in as European Tour players. You've always had simple structures around you. You've never been one who's been over technical, had coaches hanging around you, or you know things like that. The team, as such, which a lot of guys do, is that something you do? You agree with that aspect of the game, or do you think it's it's very much a personal thing? Well, I think the modern game uh, players feel they have to have a whole big support network and all sorts of people there offering advice and offering help. Uh, I'd done it myself because I always believed that it's up to me to put the ball on the green. It's up to me to put the ball in the hole or beside the hole. And then it's up to me to do the same thing on the next hole. Yeah. So whether I've help or support, it's still up to me to do it. Now, obviously, if I have problems with my swing or problems with my short game, I do have support and I do have help here at home in Ireland. But I have the same people that, I, I, that would have helped me back in... 1987 right. and those people who helped me back in 87 become a better player I still use those people but you're right I haven't changed technically and I never really saw the necessity to change you spoke about progression you know you're you're a seasoned campaigner on tour now you're very very well respected everyone admires your game <laughs> but they do you know because you're you know, there's a saying on tour where I left a couple of shots out there and you're famous for the fact that you don't really leave that much out on the golf course. Where do you see your natural progression from here going forward? Because I presume you, you feel you have a lot, a lot of golf left in you. Last year, 2011, was a tough year for me and I felt, and my caddy would, would probably agree with me, that anything that could go wrong went wrong. Okay. Any time I could have made a bogey or could have made worse than a bogey it did any time I, 
had an opportunity to miss it, but I missed it. So last year was a funny year, but I still believe in my brain, I still believe I've more improvement to be done to be done. I still believe that I can do it and I still believe I can win. Is do you think luck plays a huge part in 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 good seasons or in wins or or just generally as a rule? I believe that a, a, a good player probably plays well enough to win between six and ten tournaments a year. Okay. That's how well he plays. Six to ten tournaments a year. But he might win one in three years. And why is that? Because the standard is so high and the bounce of a ball or whether a ball bounces over a bunker mm -hmm. or bounces straight into the face and plugs. You know, all these things have a massive effect. When I won in China, I remember a chip in. I had to lob ball over a bunker and I really was doomed in this position I was in. So I hit this shot up in the sky, down, lands, rolls over into the hole. There was two shots straight away. Look at the leaderboard, seven in the lead. Mm -hmm. That's fate, Gary. Yeah. And when, when it's your turn and when things are good and when you have the rub of the green on your side, you win. And you need that, you know. So, you know, all, all you can do is keep working positively on your game and wait for your turn. I believe it's when it's your turn, it's your turn. And then needless to say, some people are lucky enough to accept the trophy and other guys finish second or third. Damien, 2012 is the first year where you're uh, kind of head to toe almost with a manufacturing deal with TaylorMade. How, how excited are you to join up with them? Yeah, it's, it's my first time to, to commit, uh, seriously commit. Um, TaylorMade, I've, I've always used some of their equipment, but now I've, I've committed to using more of their equipment and uh, I've enjoyed it. I, 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 after last season, 2011, it's very easy for me to make a change yeah. and it's very easy for me to say, right, it's time now, fresh start, I'm coming off a bad spell and uh, I've committed to using their equipment and uh, it can't do any harm because I'm coming off a negative spell okay. and I, I have no interest in using the same equipment in 2012 than I have done in the past where I struggled with the same equipment mm -hmm. and it's a new start new beginning new bag new ideas and because my equipment has changed it gives me a new focus new reason to practice which is good and uh, I, I so far I've enjoyed using this stuff and I, I, I think it can it can help me get back on track how do you feel Damien at the moment with the the role of the other Irish guys on tour, with the success, success that they have had, you know, all being major success, and Rory is, you know, kind of superstar mode, and, and, and Graham and, and Podrick, and then Darren wins, wins the Open uh, last year at Sandwich. How do you think that reflects on the other Irish guys on tour? Because we're such a small nation, I believe, it, I believe we're in it together. So it's their success indirectly rubs off on the rest of us. It gives us great profile around the world. It gives us, the media want to talk to us all mm -hmm. because the buzz is I Ireland and Irish golf. So it's very positive. We, if we weren't winning, I believe that possibly the younger players would suffer. Maybe the Irish Sports Council would have less money to divvy out, yeah. which I was a recipient of and I think yeah. you were as well, and, yeah. and at the time we needed it. Absolutely. So I think that the, the whole knock-on effect is, has been very, very positive in tough times. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, one of my lasting memories is listening to Greg Allen on the radio driving home from Birkdale. I was on my way home from Birkdale and listening to Porrick winning. It was, it was incredible, you know, and I was proud. Yeah. And I was proud to be Irish. And I was proud to say I know the man. Yeah. And I was so excited. But they're, they're memories I'll always have. And it's very important for Irish golf. And as a result, we've great players. We've so many new great players. The Carton House is a fabulous training ground now with the golfing union. So there's so many positive things at the moment. And it's all because of the success that's gone, gone in the last few years. If we didn't have that success, things would be very different. Mm -hmm. Damien, the Ryder Cup is coming around this September. Is that uh, something that's in your plans? Is it part of your focus or something you're gonna watch on TV? I think it's in the back of my mind. If I could win a couple of tournaments, or one tournament, I need to say you start with one. If I could win one tournament over the next few months, that would give me an opportunity to 
be in the reckoning. And then needless to say, I probably need to win at least twice. And then I was solid enough year after to just, to, just to have a chance. Because needless to say, I don't get into all the majors, I won't get into World Series events. So the odds are slightly stacked against mm -hmm. me. But a win, win changes everything, doesn't yep. it? So yep. uh, I'd, be lo I'd be looking forward to at least having, having an opportunity to be in the frame. Do you think the fact that there's two divisions almost on tour, it's, it's more difficult for the guys that don't play that world schedule to, to try play a Ryder Cup? It is, it is more difficult, yeah. yeah. Less opportunity, but you know, outside that fact, the European Tour, its lifeline is the success that the Ryder Cup has brought in the last number of years, going back a long time. Yeah. I can remember back to Darcy in 87, was it? Yeah. So like, my job is secure because of the strength and how well Europe have done in the Ryder Cup. Mm -hmm. So we all owe them a, quite a lot, those guys who, who done so well. I shiver to think what the Ryder Cup, if, if Europe had lost the Ryder Cup over the last few years, I'd shiver to think what position we would be in as European Tour players um, compared to how good we actually have it because of their success. I know the reason. I think it's testament to the Tour though because we are in very tough financial times. The Ryder Cup is a very, very important cog in that tool, but the, you know the Tour is is surviving pretty well considering the t times Yeah, but it it's, it's surviving off the back of that in the world Europe is still a major, major Tour because the European, or our side of the Ryder Cup okay. have been so successful in the last few years. but. But I shiver to think that if we lost the last two or three Ryder Cups, how successful and strong European Tour could be. Uh, because we wouldn't, in world golf, we wouldn't be given the same credit that we currently enjoy. Would you like to see more of the guys, or the top guys, base themselves in Europe more? And maybe if we edge towards that, it might, it might make the Tour a little bit stronger? It, it, that definitely would help, but I, I, I still think that the top players will always play the world schedule. Um, and let's be honest, we'd love to see all them top players playing the Irish Open. Mm -hmm. But needless to say, they, they might get a, a more lucrative deal playing Florida or playing Hong Kong. So they, they go all over the world to play because they're in demand. Mm -hmm. So um, like any pop star or whatever, if you're in demand, you go where the money is. And the top players in the world play, play in the biggest tournaments. and they will not fix themselves to Europe. How important do you think the Olympics is for the game of golf? And is it, is it something that's in your, in your sights for the future? Yeah, I think it's, it's a natural progression. I think golf should be in the Olympics. And I think it, it, when it does come around, I, I think it'll be very exciting, especially with Irish golf. And if there's, if there's two people involved or a pair of us involved, I think, you know, it'd be inc incredible because Irish golf is so strong now. And we're a small nation, remember, against all these other heavyweights. Yeah. So I think we will compete and we will do well. And I'd, I'd love to have a crack at it. You know, I, um, I've had great experiences in my life and uh, I think the Olympics would be another great experience if it comes my way. Damien McGrain, the Olympic athlete, maybe? Yeah, carrying the torch, an Olympian in Kells. Yeah, yeah, no, you know, but you know, it's, it's, um, once it happens, it's a, re it's a real opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's a real opportunity and uh, if I'm in the right place at the right time and if the clubs are talking good to me, uh, I can do it. What's the buzz for you on the golf course, you know, for the foreseeable future? Is it the, you know, just the beating the other, of other guys or trying to, to get the maximum out of Damien McGrath? Absolutely. I need, I, need to, I need to perform for my own sake and for myself. I need, to, I need to get the best out of my own game. My brain still tells me I'm young and it still tells me I'm fit and I'm strong. Um, you might tell me otherwise, but, but that's what my brain keeps yeah. telling me. And I still, it still tells me I can improve and I can get better. So once I'm getting those vibes, um, I'm going to keep going and keep traveling and keep playing. After the break, Damien tells us what it's like going head to head with the great Tiger Woods in Dubai. I says to myself, OMG, of course. <laughs> I said, I've handled it for one day. Now I have to go through it again tomorrow.
Damien, if we could slide back a little bit to 2008, and you're, you are from the Royal County, and you had a, a royal battle with Mr. Tiger Woods in, in Dubai, which was you know, the start of a, of a huge year for you. Yeah, I, I played well the first two days in Dubai, and I got drawn with Tiger, and I says, right, whew, I have to get my head around this. So I was very lucky, actually, that I had my two sisters and one of our friends from at home with us. So I had a little bit of my own support group there, and it helped me drag my brain away from Tiger Woods, Tiger Woods, tomorrow, tomorrow, you know, whatever time the tea time was, because right. I had all this back bouncing around in my brain. So yeah. when and then I got onto the range, hit a few balls, and I says to myself, if I can survive today, I can survive anything, because it was bedlam. Yeah. Everybody was very excited. My friends and my family and my friends that I meet traditionally every year in Dubai, who come out to support the golf and to watch me because they know me from Ireland, they were very excited. So I was trying to keep a little bit of distance because all this excitement, it's okay for a spectator to be excitement, but I have to try and go out and play. Yeah. So I got up on the first tee anyway, and we had a quick hello, chit chat, and... What were your nerves like? like oh, it? no, I was okay. <clears throat> but when I, when I looked down the first fairway, like there was people everywhere, and there was cameramen men everywhere on the, on the first tee box. So I says to myself, oh my God, I said, I'd be glad to get out of this in space. So both of us hit off and off we went. And on the day I remember, walking off the first tee and I says, well, this is it now. I says, well, Tiger, how are you? How's things? Just like you'd say at home. And we were chit-chatted away and he hit a weak enough tee shot off the first, hit an incredible second shot out of the bunker to about five feet left of the hole. So I made a scrawny enough par, but needless to say, a par in the first hole in Dubai is pretty okay. And yeah. he missed the putt. So I was surprised he missed the putt because I was sure he was going to do the fist pump. He was yeah. away. He's going to win the tournament. I was sure all this was going to happen because he's the best player in the world, isn't he? Yeah. So it transpired on the, the Saturday that he played poorly by his standards. I could see him playing poorly. I could see in his golf. I said to myself, Christ, he's not playing so good. Sure, I can do stuff like that. Right. You know what I mean? So, yeah. so I actually managed to get comfortable very fast. Right. Uh, we chit-chatted the whole way around and... It, it was a good experience. When it was over, I was actually relieved right. that I actually was able to go out, play reasonable. And beat him? Well, play reasonable. I'm not, I'm not compared myself to his worst day ever, but uh, I played reasonably well, and I was glad it was over, and everybody was happy. W was it just a total circus that day? It was, it was bonkers, yeah. So I'd done my interview afterwards and he'd done his. I went back to meet my caddy on the range just to hit a few balls and just figure out what I was after going through because now my ordeal was over. <laughs> so that was fine. So I go back, I'm hitting a couple of balls and there's a guy beside me practicing called Paul Broadhurst and his caddy's called Paul. So Paul chirped up and says, I'm glad we don't get, have him again tomorrow. And I says, fair enough, it looked like we were going to have him tomorrow. But then Paul informs me, I'm drawn with him again. Right. So really now, Murph, I was really, I says to myself, OMG, of course. <laughs> I said, I've handled it for one day, now I have to go through it again tomorrow. Now I, was, now I actually was struggling with the concept of playing with a man for a second day in a row. So needless to say, we broke the ice perfectly the first day. And I played with him again the second day. And he played beautiful golf. His short game was incredibly good, just like you'd expect and just like it's meant to be. He chipped a weak chip on the last green and he slammed home this incredible putt. I was standing 15 feet left of the hole. He hits this putt and it goes flying down across the green. I'm sure it's going to go into the water maybe. Right. Hits the hole, in it goes like a torpedo and he jumps around the place totally out of character, jumps around the place and everybody's going berserk and I'm going, holy Christ, I've seen it all. And... And was that just his hype, you think? Was he... It, 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 was, like, it was like it was staged. Right. And he goes ballistic for 30 seconds and then perfectly calm, picks the ball out of the hole. Heaven's okay. So I'm standing over my own putt to finish my game. I'm just after pitching two into the water backspun them into the water. So now if this eight footer across the side of the green after Tiger's slammed in this thing. So I hit my ball, thanks be to God, it falls into the hole. 
and shake his hand, I wish him well, tell him that was a good putt he just hold. He agreed with me it was a pretty good putt. We signed the scorecards and that's it. Right. So it was, it was a strange, strange weekend for me and it was a big learning curve and I enjoyed it. And I then had the, had the policy in my own head, if I could put up with that, if I could cope with the circus for that weekend, mm -hmm. um, I could cope with anything. Right. So needless to say, it's, it actually spurred me on to having a pretty good 2008. Did you feel like that he had this particular aura then, and um, maybe perhaps that aura is, is not there anymore? Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think I think the rest of the, the the rest of the players in the world have possibly caught up with with the man because he was untouchable for so long. Yeah. And but wh when he struggled, I could see everybody else in in, in his game right. because I could see him struggle just like what I've done and yeah. what maybe we've all done. I could see it, but then the second day then, I played him, sorry, it was the Sunday, he showed his world class and showed that he was the best player in the world. And as I said to myself, well, he is meant to be the best player in the world, so he should be able to play the best golf in the world. And he polished off maybe a six under or seven under, Five, 65 the Sunday, with an incredible putt on the last green, as Tiger Woods did back then. And he, and he won the tournament, so uh, I was very lucky to be part of it, and I was very lucky to see it. And it was a steep learning curve for me, and I realised that um, he's not certainly not immortal. Yeah. Uh, he's a hell of a great player, as we yeah. all know. But uh, you know, I, I was surprised because I saw him playing so average. Right. I wouldn't say I was feeling sorry for him, but I could recognise what he was up to, as we all could. But then the second day he played, he played the golf that possibly mortals dream of, right. and uh, he showed his true class and. Uh, Himself, he was very kind to me, I always say it. Uh, Steve Williams was very good to me as well. And, you know, even by my own standards, they were saying good shot and whatever. So, uh, and it, was all, it was all good, you know, it was all good. And uh, I, I, I've, I have nothing bad to say about the man. He was very kind to me and very fair to me for the weekend. We, had a, we played two rounds together and, um, you know, he didn't need to be. Yes. He didn't need to be. He was busy trying to win the tournament and I was busy trying to get the best check I could out of it. Yeah. But I was doing it the hard way because I was surrounded by this whole... Circus. Circus, yeah. In that particular week, you, you had a bad Sunday and you finished 44th, but it was, as you said, it was a huge learning curve. And then, you know, the following week in India was when you really, you know, stepped up to the plate as such. And you had a big finish there. Yeah, the following week in India then, I had a whole new experience and we were in India and things were sometimes less than perfect and yeah. and the golf course for some reason it suited my eye and I fancied the golf course and it was a tough course very yeah. tight very narrow and I started playing well and I started putting well and um, for whatever reason I had a change of caddy I had Andy Rod Stewart with me that week so um, the whole thing was a breath of fresh air right. and, and the, 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 the craziness of the previous week yeah. had passed me by and uh, I got back down to what I do best and um, I, I finished high up there in that, that tournament. So um, straight away I bounced back and uh, yeah. I enjoyed it. And again, uh, maybe a new belief in myself, maybe Gary. And then obviously China Open was, you know, your yeah. big, big breakthrough China. on tour. I the nearly forgot about that. <laughs> the, the champion of China and there's over a billion people living there. That must have been quite special. Yeah, yeah, I, I went, I went there that week, I decided I'd change my putter, I'd give it a, something fresh a go and uh, I also decided I'd maybe change my putting technique slightly. Right. So I changed my putting technique slightly to, to more a, a wavy motion rather than stiff, stiff, stiff. So it was more wavy like this. And the ball started popping into the hole. So I said, this is amazing. This is a first for me. So. For the week of China, um, I put it with this new action. I played solid, and then on the Sunday morning, the weather was atrocious. Yeah. Driving range was flooded. We practiced, we warmed up off the driving range mats. And I went up the first, and drive a five wood short of the green, pitched on to about 15 feet, and give it one of these, and in the ball goes again for a par. Right. So now I'm playing, I'm leading the tournament by two or three shots, and all of a sudden I'm holding 15 foot putts for pars in the first green. So I said, Christ, this is my day. Yeah. 
Okay. The weather was rough, and I knew that wouldn't put me off, but it would slow down everybody else. Right. But it wouldn't put me off. And what, what were the nerve factors like? Were you, were you getting ahead of yourself? No. To, no. No, I, at no point, I was enjoying my golf. I was playing well. I was seeing pars and birdies. I wasn't seeing pars and bogeys. Right. And in the bad weather conditions, people were, were seeing pars, bogeys, and maybe double bogeys. Yeah. And my putter was hot, yeah. so uh, all of a sudden I was out there, I was able to hold good putts, which you need to do on a tough day, and, and I'd look at the leaderboard, I'm three ahead, four ahead, five ahead, and going, oh my God, what am I up to? Six ahead. It was, it was an incredible day out for me. Yeah. And uh, my caddy then... The Great Horty. The Great Horty turned around and announced on the 18 tee box that even he could win from this position, <laughs> which I felt was extremely un <laughs> unhelpful. Because exactly. I just said, oh my God, here he yeah. goes. <laughs> so I, I managed to get, the, get, the get it off the last tee and get the job done. And bang, I'd won my first tournament and won it by nine shots, yeah. uh, which, you know, you'd imagine it's going to be hard and hard. It's kind of tiger-esque, isn't it, really? And you'd imagine you'd be sweating a bit, but yeah. in, in the... In the heel of the hunt, I was able to relax and take off my wet gear up the last fairway for the cameras and advertise my sponsors and um, walked home and won it and tapped it in with the back of the putter. As <laughs> collect, only you, as collect, only you collected it, my right? trophy and uh, made my speeches and, uh, you know, the whole thing was, was surreal in the end. The famous yellow jacket or gold jacket. Do you go in nightclub much with that on there? I don't know, they might charge me double in. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, it's at home in the press. I actually saw it this morning. Um, it's a bit of a shame now. It hasn't got more airings than it has, but uh, I think it's one of those things. I would have preferred a Rolex watch, maybe. Right. <laughs> or a Volvo, maybe. <laughs> or a Volvo, yeah. But, uh, you know, it's nice to have it and have a beautiful big waterfall crystal trophy as well in my home. So, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've plenty of good memories, yeah. Coming up on the cut line, how the community rallied behind Damien to give him a start in the pro ranks. I've been very lucky to have a group of people who didn't know me from Adam take me in, look after me, mind me, mind my children. Damien, if you could take us right back to the start when you got involved in this wonderful game. Was it kind of a love at first sight type of thing or how did it work out? I played pitch and putt in my home, my home town and my home club, Monaghan's at the time. And, and we had we actually two very good pitch and putt courses in the, in the town. So I played that and I became very, very competitive. So I, 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 I had this hunger to improve and be be as good or better than the people around me and then I went down to the golf club and it stemmed from there and I, and I met the club pro there at the time was Joey Purcell and um, you know I, I wanted to be I wanted to be as good as anybody around me right. so th that that really drove me forward and um, I just had a, had a desire to improve and improve and improve and uh, I believed I could improve every day and I could be I could be as good as anybody around me right. and uh, maybe that's what you need at an early stage to get yourself to be good enough because back then in the mid mid 80s um, golf was nothing like what yeah. it is now nothing yeah. like it whatsoever so um, you know I, I really was I loved the game and um, couldn't and wait what, to play it and was it you know to get the bright lights or just to to get better and constantly improve no, my buzz was being good and better than the people around me and then I wanted to be better against the people up the road right. um, and you know I, I, I was very competitive and the game certainly brings that out in you right. to be to be as competitive as possible and that brought you onto the scene of playing you know boys in the provincials and stuff and yeah culminated with the Irish boys in 88 yeah absolutely it, it I, I I played a little bit of, of um, boys golf uh, not very much and then I, I um, by chance, I went to Bar and 
got there and unloaded the clubs at the back of my father's car, I think, and went out to play golf and I hold a 20-foot putt on the last green to win off six handicap. I don't even know if I was eligible to play. <laughs> so I won off six handicap anyway, three rounds, and beat all the stars of Ireland, which was totally ridiculous, I was told. In the excitement, I signed my scorecard for a par on the last after making a birdie. Right. But that was OK, because I also cut an ad. And I added up my front nine the same day for one too many, because we'd a rain delay for an hour and a half. Right. So my front nine was the arithmetic was one too many. My back nine I signed for a four instead of a three in front of everybody to win the tournament. Of course, I didn't know any of this. Yeah. So it was actually all okay. Yeah. So it's not often you make a boo boo or a scorecard, and, and and it was actually the right way to make yeah. a boo boo. So no, was it a goal fear, or was it just something that you went down and you did well and you won it? Or yeah, I just went down, played well, and and, and I won the tournament. But you know, it, it'd be very easy to think that I shouldn't have won it. Right. And people were actually telling me, "How the hell did you win that? Or right. why did you win it?" Yeah. Uh, but to me, it was because I was ignorance in my own bliss. So I think. Um, I was happy enough in myself and I played well and from there then it gave me enc encouragement and I played more youths golf then yeah. because I think the Irish boys were the only boys tournament I ever played in. So then I went on I played youths golf and um, I got into the scene with the Golfing Union yes. of Ireland and we all met each other then yeah. and we played for Leinster and we played for Ireland and I won the Connacht Utes then in Tum a few years later. So um, that was my amateur career. Then I joined Joey as, as his apprentice. I always wanted to be a club pro. Right. Uh, that was my ambition in golf. Uh, my idol at the time was probably Joey Purcell. He was the only golf professional I knew. Uh, I was fascinated with the industry and possibly I liked who he was, the way he lived his life and his admiration in the golf club I found was incredible. Everybody looked up to him and uh, he was a good golfer to match. And needless to say, I wanted to be as good as him. And, right. and I, I, at a very early stage, I wanted to be a golf pro. Which is a, which is a different direction where a lot of kids nowadays take. And, and I probably, you know, did too in the sense that, you know, I wanted to, I'd stay longer as an amateur to play home internationals and that kind of thing. Whereas, you know, you were kind of with us and, you know, on teams with us. And all of a sudden, in, in our eyes, you were gone. You'd done the club pro thing, which was, which was a strange decision, really from our point of view? Whether, whether it's right or wrong, or whether the amateur golfer sees my decisions right or wrong, I, I had a desire to play golf at a higher level. Right. And I also had a desire to play golf for money. I had a desire to do it. And playing golf for Crystal um, didn't interest me in any shape or form. I wanted to play golf, and I believed that the professional golf scene was at a higher level. So did you have ambitions at that stage to be a tour player? No. 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 Then what happened to me then was in my apprenticeship, I then won the Irish Order of Merit as a pro in, I think, I won it in 96, 97 and 2000. Right. I think I won the Irish Order of Merit. And again, that was an important step in stone for me. But again, I wanted to be the best in the, in the, in the environment I was in. Right. So I, I strive to achieve that. I won the... Irish assistance twice. I think I might have won that in 93 and 94. Right. Again, I wanted to be the best assistant, then I wanted to be the best club pro, and then I got onto the PGA Cup team, which is which yeah. is our our at the time our version of the Ryder Cup, which was against the Americans. And, and that was in Celtic Manor. Celtic Manor, and, and we went over there, and I brought my family with me, and we had an incredible week, and we were wined and dined, and. It was one man against one man, like Ryder Cup style, right. and, and I, I enjoyed it, and, uh, and I loved the format. And um, then all of a sudden starting to say to myself, God, I'm, maybe I'm a bit better than a club pro now, and maybe it's time I thought about the tour, and I went from there to the MasterCard tour, I think we all did, and yeah. played the MasterCard tour in the UK, being a club pro in, Wex in Wexford at the time. And were you comfortable in Wexford at that stage? Were you yeah, yeah. Yeah, I started in Wexford in 97 uh, and I left Wexford in, in Christmas 2005 and, and I had a great time there. The people the people were very, very kind to me and my family and uh, they made me feel feel very welcome and uh, they were great supporters of mine and I yeah. loved their support. Yeah. Um, so And I still have it today. Yeah. 
and that's one thing that that uh, I've been very lucky with to have to have a group of people who didn't know me from Adam take me in, look after me, mind me, mind my children. Yeah. You know, and then I pack my bags. They might drop me to the airport. You know, the secretary used to caddy for me an odd time if I was penniless. So you know, it was all it was all so great. And, um, and was the PGA Cup your your kind of moment when you thought, well, you know, I've left the amateur ranks to be a club pro, and now I'm kind of almost feeling like I'm leaving the club pro ranks to be to be a tour player. Was that your your moment when you thought you had to go further? Because. I was young enough, and to be fair, I probably wasn't that young, but these days I was a probably old starting, but back in, back when I was doing it, um, I felt I was young enough to keep improving and I felt there was more out there and I felt that I had more in my tank to, that I could keep going. So I went then from the Master Car Tour to the Challenge Tour, which we all did, yeah. and then I went from the Challenge Tour onto the Main Tour, and I actually felt I could compete. I actually felt I was good enough, I was strong enough, and I had what it takes to be out there and uh, I kept trying and I kept trying and I kept trying. Then it went well for me and, and I had a good run. And then I wasn't looking after my job properly in Wexford and they were very kind to me letting me be a club pro there willy nilly or a club part time club pro. Yeah. I was very lucky, I had a couple of great lads working for me and, and they kept the show on the road when I was away. But then as my golf got better, and my income became larger, I felt that I wasn't doing my golf justice. And remember, golf was my life and yeah. my number one. So I then gave up my job in Wexford because I needed to focus fully on the golf. You know, you laughed at me, Peter Lowry laughed at me, you know, part-time golfer playing on the tour, the tour. Unheard of, ridiculous stuff. So so I, I put all my eggs in the European tour basket then and um, it's been very good to me to date. What was the big difference, say, from from Damien McGrain at, you know, as an assistant or winning the Irish region to the MasterCard to coming on to tour? Was the physically or mentally, wh where do you think the big, the big difference was? I, I believe that you have, to, you have to fit in in your surroundings and you have to let your game develop naturally. And I, my game developed at its own pace. So all I could do was sit back and let it happen and let it develop at its own pace. So like I, I could have been 30 years of age, almost 30 years of age before I got on the European tour. Mm -hmm. But I had to, I couldn't fast forward my development. Uh, I played golf, I wasn't a fanatical practicer. Uh, so, you know, I couldn't go onto the range and practice all day every day and say, well, I'm going to cut my development by two years by practicing for six months. Right. I, I just, I, I went through it and I kept everything in its box and in its place and um, my game developed at its own pace. And th that stood to me then all over my career because at least I felt that every time I made a jump, I was able for it and I was ready for it. Right. Like, thanks be to God, I've never lost my card. I never lost a challenge tour card. I never lost a MasterCard tour card. So, so each time I got to where I was going, I was able to hold on to, hold on to my footing and I wasn't falling off the face of the planet. So that was important. Mm -hmm. you know, but that, that, that came with my maturity and it came with the time it had taken me to get to those positions. Because I didn't just pop onto the tour. Yeah, exactly. It was a process and a long process maybe. Yeah. But I wouldn't change it for the world. Damien, it's been great having you on the cut line today um, here at Knightsbrook, which is always a lovely place to come to. We wish you continued success on tour and hope to see your name and lights many, many times. Thanks, Damien. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, Murph. Thank you. It was great to have the opportunity.